We are live. Thank you for joining us for the presidential state of the Institute address as part of virtual reunion and homecoming. Please make sure your volume is turned up. We will receive some questions during the registration process, and we will get to them as time allows during the Q and a portion of the program. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Prabhat Hajela, provost at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Thank you. Uh, we hope everyone is staying safe and healthy and looking forward to the programs offered through the virtual reunion and homecoming. As valued members of the Rensselaer community, we appreciate you joining us for the Presidential State of the Institute address. Today, Dr. Jackson will share how we, as an institute, continue to navigate through the pandemic while continuing to focus on key research initiatives and what the future holds as we approach our bicentennial celebration in 2024. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson, who has led our institute through a tra true transformation over the course of these past 22 years. As a result of Dr. Jackson's strategic leadership since her arrival in 1999, there have been numerous accomplishments and milestones. These include completing the $1.4 billion successful capital campaign and currently leading the second, where the halfway mark towards the 1 billion goal has been surpassed and the Institute's endowment has reached the $1 billion mark. Transforming the student experience by envisioning the award-winning concept of class, clustered learning, advocacy and support for students and bringing it to life. She has represented Rensselaer across the globe through her participation in international events such as the World Economic Forum and truly elevating the global presence of the Institute. She has received numerous national and international awards, including the National Medal of Science, the United States highest honor for achievement in science and engineering. Most recently, FBI officials presented Dr. Jackson with the FBI Albany Division's 2020 Director's Community Leadership Award for her outstanding contributions to the community. Last but not the least, we laud her efforts for leading the Institute through a global pandemic and unprecedented times with the safety of our students, faculty, and staff on campus as the absolute priority, resulting in one of the lowest infection rates on any campus in the nation. Please welcome the 18th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson. I wanna thank everyone to our second virtual State of the Institute address, and to thank you for your patience and for joining us online. While we look forward to hosting reunion and homecoming again in person, the beauty of this medium is that it does allow us to reach beyond the classes we are celebrating. The great Rensselaer classes ending in 0, 1, 5, and 6, and to invite all of our alumni, alumnae, parents, and friends to hear about our accomplishments, challenges, and plans. As you know, and as the current pandemic has reinforced, my first obligation as president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute is to keep our students, faculty, and staff safe. Thanks to our risk-informed planning and our comprehensive testing, tracing, tracking, surveillance, quarantine, and isolation, or T cubed SQI, health and safety protocols, we have managed to keep the COVID-19 case rate on our Troy campus extremely low. With over, over 270,000 tests conducted since we reopened our de-densified campus last fall, we have had a positive case rate of just over one-tenth of 1%. One this past summer and fall, our positivity rate is even lower since we instituted our vaccine mandate while continuing our other stringent health and safety protocols. Currently, our students are overjoyed to be fully back on campus and learning in person, and our low case rate has allowed that. Without question, this has been a challenging year and a half for all of us, but I'm very proud of the way the Rensselaer community has risen to the occasion, including our students who have been almost uniformly wonderful about following our protocols. We clearly educate young people highly attuned to scientific and medical developments who not only understand the gravity of this public health emergency, 
but who also see themselves as active participants in the great experiment of learning to control SARS-CoV-2. This includes the students in our maker club, The Forge, who early in the pandemic enlisted volunteers with 3D printers to help address a terrible shortage of personal protective equipment for hospital workers by printing face shields and ear savers for hospitals along the East Coast. The newest members of our Rensselaer community, the members of the classes of 2025 and architects of 2026 are just as remarkable. I am proud to report that this is the strongest freshman class in Rensselaer history in terms of academics with an average SAT score of 1,427. They also are among the most civic minded. Despite the restrictions of the pandemic, a majority of our incoming students included volunteer experience on their applications. One student delivered food to the immunocompromised. Another raised $27,000 for two hospitals. Another opened a bakery with her family and donated the earnings to a nonprofit working to address food insecurity in northern New Jersey. We truly cannot wait to see what these students will do once they are armed with a Rensselaer education. In a study of the factors that turn young people into innovators, the Opportunity Insights Group of Economists at Harvard University has found that Rensselaer is at the very top of the nation's colleges in terms of the rate at which its recent alumni and alumnae have become inventors. Number three on the list nationwide. Our current students promise to carry on this tradition. Over the past year and a half, our faculty and staff have also truly risen to the occasion. Abruptly thrust into remote teaching in the spring of 2020, by the fall of that year, many of our faculty were accommodating the needs of both remote and on-campus students by teaching in multiple modes at once, in-person, online, and a hybrid of the two. A number of pedagogical innovations arose out of the experience including in our School of Architecture, where a whiteboard application was used to duplicate the Rensselaer Studio experience in which architecture students share their drawings so that their fellow students and teachers can offer feedback. The digital whiteboard even has enhanced the studio experience in some ways, allowing comments to be preserved and prominent architects from around the world to participate in reviews of student work. Among our pandemic inspired pedagogical innovations are more flexible learning options, including the E-term or a week long enrichment set of programs across all five schools that we will be launching uh, in January, some of which will offer course credits. We also are giving high achieving students the flexibility of an accelerated path to their degrees. Now, we have had some students who have accelerated on their own, but with Excel, students who enter Rensselaer as freshmen with at least 12 advanced placement or transfer credits in STEM fields have the option of a plan of study through all the schools that allows them to achieve their Bachelor of Science degree in just three years. With Excel Plus, they can complete a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees in four years while maintaining their financial aid for the fourth year graduate degree program. Now, the urgent demands of this pandemic also have inspired remarkable research in many fields. So please allow me to offer just one example. A team of Rensselaer researchers led by Dr. Robert Lindhart the Broadbent Senior Constellation Professor of Biocatalysis and Metabolic Engineering, Chemistry and Chemical Biology, whom you see on your right, Dr. Jonathan Dordick, Institute Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering and Special Advisor to the President for Strategic Initiatives, whom you see on your left, and Professor Fuming Zhang discovered 
both the that that both the blood thinner heparin and interestingly enough an extract from edible seaweeds can bind to the spike proteins of SARS-CoV-2 before the virus can bind to mammalian cells. Now they are collaborating with researchers at the University of Mississippi to determine if these substances can be used in a protective nasal spray, an early intervention that could help us combat the Delta variant. In considering the remarkable contributions of the Rensselaer community during this pandemic, I also must thank our alumni and alumnae for their generosity in supporting the exigencies of our health and safety protocols. In particular, the Rensselaer COVID-19 Testing Initiative Fund helped us to convert our laboratory capable of doing gold standard PCR testing, an unusual resource at a university without a medical school, into a CLIA approved facility able to conduct COVID-19 testing with fast results on a large scale. I must thank our alumni and alumnae also for supporting the student experience during this difficult time. During the 2020 to 2021 academic year, our health and safety protocols meant that we could not allow our students to live in their Greek houses. Our Greek chapters faced financial hardships and deferred maintenance issues as a result. Yet many of our Greek alumni and alumnae helped to ease their heart, that hardship for their chapters with their philanthropy, with efforts that will continue through the end of the year. They contributed in other, they contributed in other ways as well, including by helping students in their fraternities and sororities find internships and other pre-professional experiences. I thank all of you for what you have done during these challenging times. And I urge you to stay involved, particularly in identifying ARCH away semester experiences for our rising juniors. The ARCH semester off campus during the traditional junior year is a critical opportunity for intellectual growth for our students, but also a great opportunity for any organization that has the benefit of welcoming a Rensselaer students for a semester or more. As you may know, I announced this past spring that I will be retiring on July 1st, 2022. It is somewhat paradoxical that reaching the end of my 23 year tenure, having led Rensselaer during the greatest public health crisis in a century, with a climate crisis bearing down upon the world, I am so optimistic about the future of the Institute and its ability to convert even extreme disruptions into opportunities. This is because of Rensselaer, its people, its legacy, and its bright future ahead. Since my tenure began in 1999 under the Rensselaer Plan and the Rensselaer Plan 2024, we have put in place the people, programs, platforms, and partnerships that have allowed Rensselaer to thrive. Now we are looking forward in ways that will allow Rensselaer to have an even greater impact globally. I often have spoken about the fact that in a highly interconnected world, we all are subject to intersecting vulnerabilities with cascading consequences when there is a triggering event. Clearly the COVID-19 pandemic is such a triggering event with enormous public health, social, economic, and geopolitical consequences. It has revealed intersecting vulnerabilities in our healthcare system, supply chains, employment policies, even in our government and its ability to mount coherent, unified responses. All of this has led to cascading consequences, lost lives, the resurgent outbreaks of COVID-19 disease, overloaded ICUs unable to take on non-COVID patients, economic weakness coupled in some sectors with surging demand, and shortages of key materials and products we depend upon for our daily lives. Anticipating and preventing such triggering events 
and their potential domino effects require collaborations across disciplines, sectors, geographies, and generations. Rensselaer, as the new polytechnic, excels, excels at catalyzing such collaborations. Now, we have identified four areas of global vulnerability that align with our signature thrusts in research and education. For each of these areas, we are focusing on the establishment of new centers or institutes that will encompass expertise across Rensselaer and important partnerships around the globe. The first institute is one that I had the pleasure of announcing last spring at the White House Leaders Summit on Climate, and that is the Rensselaer Institute for Energy, the Built Environment, and Smart Systems, or EBIS. EBIS, which is based in Industry City in Brooklyn and in Troy, is bringing together our schools of architecture and engineering and involving our other schools with distinguished partners that include industry leaders Siemens and Lutron Electronics, the building engineering consulting firm Thornton Tomasetti, the international architecture firms HKS and OBMI and Perkins and Will, and the Brooklyn Law School. Together, Rensselaer and its partners are addressing the grand challenge of energy security, climate change mitigation and adaptation, and urban growth. Much of the population growth expected worldwide over the next three decades will take place in cities. By 2050, the world cities will need to grow to accommodate 2.5 billion additional people. Yet our built environment already is responsible for nearly 40% of annual global carbon emissions in building materials and construction and in building operations, especially heating and cooling. So as we expand our cities, we also must move with great urgency toward energy efficiency. In addition, we must anticipate the effects of climate change on our cities and engineer greater resilience into them. Hurricane Ida recently offered us tragic demonstrations of the ways that our existing urban infrastructure can prove inadequate to extreme weather we now experience. In New Orleans, people died of oppressive heat after a power outage. In New York City, people drowned in basement apartments. Today, our cities are not optimized for energy use, for climate resilience, or for the health and well being of all of their citizens. Our built environment does not interact intelligently with the electric grid, with transportation infrastructure, with supply chains. New approaches and new technologies offer the possibility of seamlessness. The opportunity here is to view each city as a system of systems and to allow sophisticated interactions and exchanges of information among them in order to achieve a collective multi-scale intelligence to the benefit of all. EBIS will focus on deep decarbonization and climate resilience, bringing together architects, engineers, scientists, and policymakers to devise responsive new materials and building platforms for net zero structures, and to model and design cities with integrated emissions-free transportation communications and supply chain networks. With our partner, the Brooklyn Law School, EBES will also model the appropriate regulatory and legal considerations, balancing information flow for the seamless operation of a system of systems with cybersecurity and privacy to protect city dwellers as they move about and ensuring that renewable energy resources are equitably shared. The second great vulnerability Rensselaer is focusing on is that of human disease and our need to realize the promise of precision medicine and to improve public health. Like EBES, our incipient Center for Engineering and Precision Medicine, or CEPM, 
will be based in New York City. A partnership in both research and education with our affiliate, the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, will drive advances in point of care and point of use devices and diagnostics in microphysiological platforms for discovery and diagnosis, in robotic surgery, biomedical imaging, and in artificial intelligence and machine learning applied to biomedical data, all rooted in fundamental biological science and biological engineering. It will focus on neuroengineering for the minimally invasive controlled and regulation of neural surgery, immunoengineering to help our bodies fight cancer and infectious diseases, and regenerative and reparative medicine for personalized tissue repair and regeneration. With this center, we will create a doctoral program in engineering and precision medicine that will enable students to earn joint, dual, or individual doctorates from Mount Sinai and Rensselaer. The third global challenge we have identified as one where Rensselaer can contribute uniquely is that of making the highest possible use of rapidly advancing digital tools. At Rensselaer, we have built a remarkable computational ecosystem that includes the Rensselaer Institute for Data Exploration and Applications, or the Rensselaer IDEA, the Rensselaer IBM Artificial Intelligence Research Collaboration, our Cognitive and Immersive Systems Laboratory, and our Center for Computational Innovations, which houses AMOS, the most powerful supercomputer at an American private university and one of the world's most advanced test beds for artificial intelligence applications. Now we are taking those resources and our talent and bringing them together in a new Institute for Data, AI, and Computation, or DIC. DIC will help to advance new computational paradigms, including those that are a hybrid of conventional neuromorphic and quantum computing, combining bits, neurons, and qubits, allowing humanity to address challenges at a new level of complexity. And with new programs for graduate students, DAKE will help to educate the next generation of leaders for these new paradigms. It will allow us to use and advance quantum computing, edge computing for networks and cyber physical systems, and quantum communications, among any number of other opportunities and challenges. Finally, as we assess the intersection of humanity's greatest vulnerabilities with Rensselaer expertise, we will focus on fresh water. Climate change, pollution, and overuse are stressing lakes, rivers, aquifers, and wetlands around the world with potentially cascading consequences. So at Rensselaer, we intend to build upon the knowledge we already have acquired about freshwater ecosystems at our Margaret A. and David M. Darren Class of 40 Freshwater Institute and through, and through the Jefferson Project, which is born of a partnership with IBM and the Fund for Lake George, which uses novel sensor platforms and massive amounts of streaming data to guide instrumentation and to help us to understand threats to New York State lakes, including the use of road salt and questions of how toxic algae form. Now, we envision a global freshwater institute to better understand stressors on freshwater resources at all scales, from the molecular to the macro, and to develop strategies to conserve fresh water around the globe. Now, this is by no means all that we are doing. And it is indeed a thrilling moment to be part of the Rensselaer community. And I thank you for allowing me to introduce our ambitions going forward. Please stay tuned for details of four upcoming presidential global game changers panel discussions focusing on these four key initiatives 
and the challenges they will address. Before we move to our question and answer period, please allow me to introduce our portfolio experts, our leaders, who will help me to clarify the finer points of inquiry, uh, my cabinet, our academic leaders, and others. First, Dr. Prabhat Hajela, uh, you can wave, our provost, whom you met. Mr. Craig Cook, Secretary of the Institute and General Counsel. Ms. Barbara Howe, Vice President for Finance and Chief Finance Officer, who is leaving Rensselaer and whom we thank for her valuable service, especially during this pandemic. Ms. Eileen McLaughlin, our incoming Vice President for Finance and Chief Financial Officer. Dr. Robert Hull, Acting Vice President for Research. Mr. John Kolb, Vice President for Information Services and Technology and Chief Information Officer. Dr. Peter Konworski, Vice President for Student Life. Dr. Lee McElroy, Associate Vice President and Director of Athletics. Mr. Curtis Powell, Vice President for Human Resources. Mr. John Wexler, Vice President for Enrollment Management. Mr. Greg Easton, Vice President for Institute Advancement. Dr. Jonathan Dordick, Institute Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering and All Things Related and Special Advisor to the President for Strategic Initiatives. I don't know if we made it on, but one of our key leaders is Dr. Les Lawrence, who is the Executive Director for Health and Wellness. We have Dr. Kurt Brenneman, Dean of the School of Science. Mr. Evan Douglas, Dean of the School of Architecture. Dr. Chanaka Edrasinga, Acting Dean of the Lally School of Management. Dr. Shekhar Garde, Dean of the School of Engineering. Dr. Mary Simone, Dean of the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. Dr. Eric Krauss, Dean of Academic and Administrative Affairs for the Rensselaer Hartford campus. Uh, Dr. Stan Dunn, who is Vice Provost and Dean of Graduate Education. And Dr. Keith Mu Young, Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Education. And now I'll walk through uh, some questions we received uh, from those who registered. First, uh, the question is, there have been some questions about how Rensselaer has fared financially during the pandemic. Well, preparing and managing the Institute through essentially two years of the global pandemic has cost us a lot. It's cost us approximately $53 million in lost revenue and $15 million in additional expenses. However, through prudent management and expenditure controls, we have successfully managed the disruptions and costs of the pandemic. In addition to that, over the past two years, the Institute was able to grow its endowment to over $1 billion. This is for the first time in Rensselaer history, while successfully refinancing nearly 50% of its outstanding debt. And so our endowment far exceeds our debt at this point. We also have seen, in fact, some of the strongest operating results and cash flow in at least 20 years. In fact, the strongest in over 20 years. Now, honestly, financial challenges remain, but our performance planning and budgeting, coupled with the support of the Board of Trustees and alumni and alumni, and with our strong finance organization, will allow us to manage through the headwinds. Uh, Barbara, I don't know if you have any additional comments you wanna make. Hi, Dr. Benson, um, thank you. You covered it very uh, well. Um, I will add though that this is a all Institute effort um, and, you know, we have weathered the last two years very well, and that is a testament to the vision of the Institute and the commitment to ensuring the um, financial strength of the Institute and the health and safety of the community. 
And thank you for that, Barbara. You know, I mentioned how Rensselaer people have stepped up to address the actual COVID-19 pandemic, but you know, how an institution weathers through a storm says a lot about the character of an institution and the people in it. And this community has been amazing in adapting to some stringent uh, requirements in order to help us manage through. So thank all, uh, thank all of you for that. Here's a second question. Several of our alumni and alumnae have asked about the U.S. news rankings, which do not seem to fully reflect the quality of a Rensselaer education. Well, we agree with that. Um, now, here's the thing. The process of uh, university rankings has changed significantly since many of our alumni and alumnae attended Rensselaer. In general, those rankings favor institutional wealth and exclusivity rather than outcomes for graduates, which are excellent for Rensselaer. And so institutions with big endowments tend to rank at the top. The interesting thing is we nonetheless attract some of the most talented and focused young people, as well as the ability to have um, some of the most brilliant and dedicated and focused faculty. Now, the US News and World Report has reduced the weight it assigns to parameters that were in our favor in the past, including our reputation with high school counselors and even with the employers of our graduates. Again, this latter is an important outcome measure, but somehow it gets less weight. So new evaluation metrics have been added that favor institutions that have large enrollments of Pell Grant eligible students, and we have our share. But state universities have benefited from this recent change. They're larger and they enroll many more such students. Um, now there's a metric that penalizes and or rewards institutions on the basis of student debt, and our students do graduate with some debt. We do uh, a lot, however, relative to financial aid, but again, it doesn't take into account the outcomes for these students, including very high early career salaries and the ability to pay back loans. And we don't have really very much at all of a default rate on our student loans. Now for engineering school rankings, universities with large enrollments in graduate programs relative to their faculty size rank higher. Now here, over the last several years, we have been selected, focusing largely on doctoral students as we have built up uh, our research capabilities. But we do expect to grow our master's degree programs, both in person and online, as well as certificate programs in the years ahead. And so if we look at return on investment, uh, nobody beats us, and that's what we focus on in terms of our impact in the world, in terms of our research, in the innovative ways we teach, and in particularly on the impact on our students and graduates. But let me turn to the provost and ask him uh, to say a few words, and then I'll turn to John Wexler as well about how we try to help our students vis-a-vis uh, -vis financial aid. Jackson, you have uh, covered this whole issue of rankings so thoroughly that I'm at a loss of words, to be honest, but <laughs> I can only say, and I can reiterate the fact that uh, these uh, rankings have become largely a function of fame, wealth, and exclusivity, and uh, really don't uh, focus as much on outcomes because uh, as, a, as, as a university, uh, we, we have resources which are growing, but still limited. Uh, well resourced institutions with very big endowments do very well in these rankings and this happens year after year. If you look at uh, the mobility within these ranks, there is hardly to speak of, any to speak of, because uh, institutions have cemented their place in, in these ranking systems. But we continue to stay focused on the return on investments, how well our students place with employers, uh, how well they are paid both at the start of their careers, mid-career, and end career, and those are the kinds of things that we are interested in. 
If you look at, for example, things like engineering school rankings at the undergraduate level, it's simply, uh, it becomes like a, a, a reference from faculty, department heads, and deans. It's really nothing more tangible than that that comes out in, in those kinds of rankings. So that, that's about what I can add to the comments that you made. I think they were very thorough. Thank you. Uh, Wex? Hi, thank you, Dr. Jackson. Um, overall, we have increased the level of financial aid. Our overall financial aid budget at the Institute is $200 million in awarding to students. We've met more need than we've ever had historically. And obviously during COVID-19, we had a lot of our current students and incoming students that had financial issues. And we, we did everything in our power and we, we have an emergency fund that we utilize to allow students to be able to stay here um, and working with both the academic departments to let us know who those students are and student life and other areas that we are able to maintain a lot of the students that are here, but we're, and we're continuing every year to evaluate the needs and lower the amount of debt that students come, that students leave with. Um, you should know, and the, those watching should know that our students leave with below the national average in debt. And needless to say, to your point, they graduate earning more in their first jobs. And many of the ones watching this video know that they they continue to earn, their earnings continue to go up. And so they are less indebted down the road than the average student nationally. When you see a lot of these stats, keep in mind the national stats also inco include medical school, law school, and other graduate schools, not just undergrad institutions. So, put in perspective. So, earlier I had spoken about the, the impact of from a financial point of view of the pandemic, you know, on the Institute. But as I said, you know, our key focus is on the health and safety of all members of the Rensselaer community and especially our students. And no one's been at the front line of that more than Dr. Les Lawrence, uh, who uh, is executive director of health and wellness here at Rensselaer. And so Dr. Lawrence, could you just, you know, give some people more of a sense of how we've gone about uh, taking care of these young people, everything from testing to other things that we've done. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we've, you know, we've, we've uh, implemented a testing system, which has helped us keep track of cases and keep the cases low, right? If we can find people early, um, get them isolated away from other people if they're infected, we can keep the number of cases very low. Last year, we were testing every student twice a week, every week. This year, we started um, once a week for every student who's fully vaccinated. We do have a very few numbers of students who have medical exemptions um, who are unvaccinated. They test twice a week still, just like we did last year. Um, having almost everyone on the campus vaccinated has made a huge difference. Um, our numbers are very low. We've only had 35 positives all uh, since August 30 or since August 23rd, excuse me. Um, we've had 35 positives and all but three of those have been in vaccinated people, which has kept the symptoms um, uh, very mild. Um, we still uh, follow the same protocols that we did last year as far as we, I talked about the testing, also the tracing and tracking. So anybody who's a positive, we will follow up, make sure that who their contacts have been over the past three to seven days, depending on their symptoms and their viral load. Um, and then we'll check in with each one of, the, one of those people to make sure they've been vaccinated, get them into quarantine if necessary. Tracking, we're looking at where the outbreaks are occurring almost exclusively this year all of our positives are coming from two places, bars and restaurants. So if I could keep people out of bars and restaurants, we would not have any cases. I have been unable to do that thus far, but um, that's where every single case, with the exception of two, we have two cases that, are, that um, in uh, employees that came from their children, their children got infected at school and brought it home to them. But all of the other, uh, 33 cases have come from bars or restaurants. Not a surprise, because I know you've all heard that on television, that that's the most, the most likely places, right? Everybody takes off their mask in bars and restaurants to drink and or eat. Um, so we do the tracking, so we find out where the cases are occurring so we can warn the students, hey, 
you know, if you go to six bars or, or three restaurants in one day, your odds of getting COVID increased dramatically. And we have sent out emails to that effect. Um, and then quarantine and isolation. So testing, tra uh, tracing, tracking, um, quarantine and isolation or surveillance, quarantine and isolation. Surveillance is just we're watching all, um, what the CDC is recommending, the latest recommendations, as well as um, looking out for new variants. And then quarantine and isolation, I think, are self-explanatory. I don't need to mention those. So I'll stop there, but would be glad to answer any questions that anybody might have. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Now, the key to our what this, the testing regime has been a lab that that emanates from a lab that uh, Dr. John Dordick runs. John, I don't know if you want to say something about our uh, capabilities, and and they came out of our investments as well in biotechnology and the life sciences. I further mentioned that it was a fully licensed lab, and I want to have uh, Mr. Curtis Powell talk about you know how that came about. So, John. Yeah, Dr. Jackson, thanks. Um, you know, we decided back early, back in the spring of 2020, that it was critical if we're going to address our ability to open up and to uh, keep people safe, that we were going to have to establish a laboratory that we would be able to run on our own uh, and ultimately get state approval through uh, an overflow facility that uh, Curtis can mention. And we we're going to have to develop some capability and to do it quickly. So I had gone to Dr. Jackson and said, I think we can do it. Uh, I'm not sure she truly believed it, but nonetheless, we, <laughs> we, uh, she said, okay, do whatever you need to do to get this to work. Uh, and with that encouragement and with the support of essentially everyone you see here today, we will, we were able to get a laboratory up and running, uh, uh, we had some good people at our Heparin Applied Research Center that enabled this to get off the ground. Uh, and we've run uh, over 250, 260,000 tests since that point, uh, initially in pools and now as individual samples, developing a whole wide range of new kinds of PCR technologies that we have been given approval by the state to run under an emergency use authorization and that we promise to get everything back to the person testing within 24 hours, because if it goes longer than that, it defeats the purpose of having a, a rapid PCR test. Uh, and so really this is a, a, a group effort of many people. Dr. Jackson really laid down the gauntlet that said, we need to do something like this. And, uh, uh, and again, provided the necessary support, which is not cheap, to set up a laboratory like this. And of course, the partnership both with Les Lawrence on the front end of it uh, in terms of getting the samples, uh, all of student life to organize that and uh, with uh, human resources with Curtis uh, and his staff really driving both our ability to get people into the laboratory to uh, help run it as well as getting the approval for uh, an overflow facility. You know, we've been keeping this going and it's been uh, both exciting. Uh, unfortunately, we had to do it, but uh, but we've learned a lot and we've learned a lot about how to do things quickly, efficiently, and we have some really good people doing the work. So we've learned a lot about them too. So I want to thank all of everyone really here on the screen today uh, that enabled this to go forward. Well, well thank you. Uh... John, I will tell you that the turnaround is faster than 24 hours. It's it's within the day and usually within hours. So uh, well, I, I, I should mention one other thing. You know what actually turned out to be the most complex and it always seems to be is the IT because we have to keep things pretty private uh, and the ability to do IT on something that places spend hundreds of millions of dollars on and to be able to do it just as effectively with far less resources was something that John Kolb and his group uh, provided. And, and so, of course, I can't uh, say enough about how that's turned out. Well, it's because we have uh, Curtis Powell and John Kolb. Curtis, you want to say a few words? Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, President Jackson. Uh, John Dordick 
uh, he and his staff, they, they've done a fabulous job in, in testing. Uh, and I'm glad John mentioned uh, John Cole and his staff in pulling together a, a laboratory information system. More importantly, the partnership that we have with St. Peter's partners has, have been, has been uh, wonderful for them to uh, extend to us overflow license to be able to run a lab of this nature. And I was pleased that uh, President Jackson had a conversation with the President and CEO, Jim Reed, uh, to work through this authorization uh, to allow us to do this. And so the facilitation of, of this entire process has really helped the Institute uh, immensely. So again, thank you for, for the work that uh, we've done uh, across the board and we'll continue to do it. And we're going to have to move on, but there has been so much work in the background with the uh, laboratory information system, but with the IT, just generally, there's a, a daily health app that students have to do, how we structure the slots they use to, for eating, their reporting, and they, how they set up and, and, and re reserve their times for getting tested and keep up with their days. And so, uh, John Cole, um, thank you. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do that uh, without you. So it shows how all of this comes together. Uh, let me uh, go on. Uh, an alumnus asks, how does Rensselaer position itself to be an engineering leader in the coming decades? Now, you know, as I've outlined, the world is changing rapidly. And so we have to organize ourselves to anticipate the future. And that has to cover what we do in research and, and what we do through the schools. And, and what we do pedagogically. So I'm going to ask uh, Shaker, uh, Gardy, our Dean of Engineering, to say a few words, and then I'm going to ask uh, uh, Keith Mu Young, our uh, Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Education, to talk about some of our pedagogical innovations, because all these things flow together, the research, the, the particular structure through the schools, and because our faculty in the schools lead that research, and, and then the teaching. Uh, so. Uh, Shaker. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. And I also want to thank the alumnus who asked the question. It is really an important question. And when we have the um, reunion and homecoming in person, I invite you to, to visit us to see what's going on on campus. Um, there, there, I think there are two important factors that make this question really important. One is that the world is absolutely changing rapidly, but also higher education is changing rapidly. And so if we want to be at the leading edge, we have to uh, align our priorities to move there at the, at the leading edge. And so to me, as the Dean of Engineering, uh, it means three things. One is in research, uh, we have to focus on areas that are key for the, for the um, alignment with the future. And so those to me mean data, artificial intelligence and computing, um, energy, uh, the built environment, as well as the natural environment and smart systems, means climate uh, change and sustainability, human health and well-being and generally, but also engineering and precision medicine specifically. And, and finally, um, security of cyber, physical and biological infrastructure. So we have to build strength in these areas. Um, in the area of education, of course, Rensselaer is known as, as one of the leading institutes that educates uh, outstanding engineers and, and uh, scientists, architects, and, and so on. Um, so we are innovative, but we must be con we must continue to be innovative in our pedagogy. Um, as uh, as uh, people may know that we launched a data dexterity requirement a couple of years ago, the School of Engineering has launched a data science and engineering minor, and there's a large number of concentrations and minors that that have come out of uh, Rensselaer that um, that will continue to to happen. And the final factor I would say is that we have to push. Um, um, ahead strongly in the area of diversity. We, we must educate uh, um, diverse uh, group of students and we must create welcome and inclusive, env inclusive environment. And collectively, I think that will put us um, in a leadership position. Um, okay. Keith. Keith Muyang. Dr. Jackson, uh, you know, what I would say is Rensselaer continues to build upon its past and create the future. And when we talk about building upon the past, as we know, you know, we, we are the first university that was created 
to utilize laboratory training as part of the education of our students. Uh, Rensselaer has continued to be a leader and the leader in learn by doing education. Uh, in, you know, we've created project-based and studio-based learning, both in architecture, engineering, in the sciences. So we have a, a great past. We are this university that flipped the classroom uh, and showed the world how to flip the classroom. And what I'd say is in the area of creating the future, uh, our faculty are immersed in uh, immersive technologies, in uh, embodied learning. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on gamification, our games faculty. We're looking at new ways to revolutionize how we teach and how we learn while maintaining our past uh, history of the strong laboratory hands-on education that we give in engineering, science, in the humanities, social sciences, and in architecture, of course. And one of the things that I would uh, like to close with is just say that, you know, our faculty are deeply engaged with the learning of our students. Uh, we're one of the few research universities that are in that top pantheon of top 50 plus universities where the undergraduate education is tantamount to everything that we do. We build our research programs, we build everything with in mind the student at the center, whether it's at the undergraduate or graduate level, and that's not going to change. And as we look at, for example, projects that we have uh, created through our CECL laboratory, such as the uh, Mandarin project, we're looking at how do we expand that other languages, how do we expand that to other areas of, uh, of you know, education so that we can really move forward that needle of uh, really changing the pedagogical infrastructure of you know, and landscape of higher education, which I believe we are the foremost and leading institution in that arena. Thank you, Keith. You know, it's interesting. Um, there's a lot of discussion about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, but the real way to look at that is that we need to welcome and educate the full complement of talent uh, nationally and from around the world. And if we uh, exclude women and underrepresented minorities, we have not tapped the complete talent pool. And so uh, it is very important. Also, one is not uh, getting the benefit of all the best ideas. And so we have to do the research. Uh, we innovate in how we educate our students uh, and we create platforms to support uh, what we do. And, and Keith has told you about some of those innovations and our innovations occur both from a content point of view. Uh, we have created 25, over 25 new degree programs over the, the life of the two Rensselaer plans. And we've created new academic pathways for students through the Institute. That's what the ARCH does. And now what we're doing with Excel and Excel Plus and with the enrichment term. And uh, you know, Keith is leading the way in, in a lot of that. But the other piece is Keith mentioned uh, using uh, gamification uh, as part of a pedagogical approach. But, and interestingly enough, that emanates from our strength in games and simulation arts and sciences that comes directly out of our uh, School of Humanities, Arts and Sciences and Social Sciences which Mary Simone has so ably led. And one of our unique degrees we've created is a Bachelor of Science in Music. And of course, our Dean um, is, you know, a world-class performer, composer, and choreographer. Uh, Mary, do you wanna say a, a few seconds of some, a few words about some of uh, what's happened in HASS? And then I think I have a short answer to a last question here. Um, because we have to close out. Okay, great. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, we are super excited about the Bachelor of Science in Music. Um, we have students that have performed um, all over New York City and are getting ready for concerts coming up yet this semester. Um, in the program in Game Simulation Arts and Sciences, we've launched a Master of Science and also a PhD in Critical Game Design. We welcomed our first cohort last fall and it's a very popular program and i think i'll i'll stop there 
Well, you know, I wish I had time really to uh, to highlight every one of the deans. I mean, some of the most innovative things going on in pedagogy that we've learned through this pandemic have emanated from the uh, our School of Architecture. It's a, a very unique, uh, you know, a very powerful school, and and some of our ideas relative to the arch came from uh, the the international focus that. Uh, the School of Architecture has had, um, and they've uh, used uh, the impact platform for uh, focus in what they call parametric design. You have to let him tell you what that is. And, but we as well know that there is no, uh, you know, leadership in engineering, which has always been our core, if we don't have world-class, uh, uh, world-class School of Science and a world-class School of Management and, and, uh, you know, Kurt Brenneman has uh, really led us uh, down the, any number of strong pathways. A lot of our strength that we have in data dexterity and data analytics emanates from both uh, from his school, both with respect to the computer science as, and, and mathematics, but also with our IT and web sciences program. So I want to thank you for that, Kurt. And then. Uh, uh, Chanaka Edrasinga has really uh, totally uh, changed the uh, uh, Lally School of Management and and doing really important work uh, with the use of data analytics and work in financial technology and quantitative finance. And so uh, these are important uh, changes. And so I would invite you to talk to any and all of them about some of the most unique things that we're doing. So finally, uh, is a question that says, some of our alumni and alumnae have asked, what tangible measures the Institute is taking to reduce its own client impact and whether we have set trackable goals? And so I would answer it this way. Now we focus on intelligent systems for building management and we incorporate that uh, into the management of a, a pretty old physical plant. Uh, we focus on lessening waste streams and recycling. And that when we build or do major renovations, designing and building the most energy efficient buildings and building them to the highest uh, environmental standards. Uh, we use alternative fuels for transportation uh, where we can, and we strongly support and uh, the use of electric vehicles and have charging stations here on the campus. And so, it's easier to set those goals uh, in terms of waste streams and recycling, and we do. It's easier if one is building a new facility to lay in uh, different uh, standards, but actually through EBES, we will have the opportunity to do unique uh, uh, retrofitting of pre-existing structures as and introducing new uh, um, uh, systems in those buildings to lessen uh, energy footprints. And so I will just say, stay tuned, uh, uh, stay engaged, and please support your alma mater, because in doing that, you're supporting our students, our faculty, and all the wonderful people who work here at the great Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, have a good afternoon. And uh, I thank you for listening. Thank you to Dr. Jackson and the leadership team. Thanks also to each of you for participating. We hope you'll join us for some of the other great events planned for the weekend, including the virtual Rensselaer Alumni Hall of Fame induction, a performance from the Rensselaerics, the football game versus Buffalo State College, and several men's and women's hockey games. Be sure to join the RPI Reunion Hub to connect with fellow alums through instant message and video chats using a search-based feature on class year or school. This can be found in registration on reunion.rpi.edu, where you can also view the complete schedule, the virtual passport to Rensselaer, and register for any and all virtual events. Finally, our second annual virtual auction in support of student scholarship is live and closes tomorrow at 9 o'clock p.m. EDT. If you haven't had a chance to bid on the more than 25 exciting items, visit 
bidpal.net slash RPI 2021 to browse items and place a bid. If you don't want to bid on any items, you can still support student scholarship by clicking on the make a donation option. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy and enjoy the rest of virtual reunion and homecoming.